Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate you being on my channel. I appreciate your support always. And today's topic is one of the most important aspects of the business that I was in, which is the escort business. Screening. If you look at your own life, it is very important that you screen everybody that you let into your circle of trust. And the business I was in was no different, especially since the escorts and the clients and myself, we all depended on the safety and the security that the screening system provided in order to protect our community, if you will, especially that it was illegal still in this country. So it was very important that I follow a good screening system. What made it more challenging in my case is like in Las Vegas, I had a big operation. I had 200 girls at the same time, escorts, and I had between 30 and 35 phone girls at all times. So I only had to train the main phone girls for them to train the other phone girls on how to screen calls. In Orange County, I decided that I was gonna be the only one behind the scenes because I did not want to give anyone enough information about the way I did business that it will help in enable them to <clears throat> tell on me or drop a dime or turn informant. Uh, so I, it, was, it was a very, very difficult decision, but it was the only decision I could have made if I wanted to actually pursue the project I had in mind when I operated in Orange County, California. So I had a five-year plan and a monetary goal, and whichever one come first, I was very disciplined in stopping everything on the dime. So screening is one of those subjects that I could give you a blueprint. It's kind of like cooking. I could give you a full recipe exactly step-by-step, step, and I can even give you a video and show you step-by-step step how to make it. Sometimes some people are talented enough where they just do it and it comes out delicious. Some other people, they could just, you know, follow one cup of this, three quarters of this, and just have the blueprint. And for some reason, they cannot get it right. It just does not taste the same. Same thing applies when I screened my clients and my escorts. In other words, there was two sections for my screening system. One was something that I followed, like a protocol. So I get a call, I do A, B, C, and D, and I come to a conclusion A or B, and then I went with it. Now, the second section of my screening system was a little bit more tangible. In other words, it's not something that I could teach someone. Something that is been developed inside of me from fielding years and years and years of calls, thousands and thousands of calls, if not millions, uh, between Las Vegas and before that, and, and of course, Orange County. So that gut instinct that I developed, or intuition, if you will, something that really it's hard to teach because it comes with being Streetwise, it's coming be, from being uh, involved with a lot of people throughout your life. Like I had different businesses, restaurants, nightclubs, a uh, talent agency, uh, a show in Hawaii that I produced, a limo service, a transportation company. So I got to experience a lot of different types of people. And I've always been a, a student of human behavior, so that really helped me because I'm always watching people, what they say, how they say it, what they do, their actions, more importantly, and how they do it. So that really gave me an edge, among other things that I had in my uh, arsenal, if you will, to give me a really good heads up on screening both clients and escorts alike. We'll talk about the escorts first and I'll go to the clients really briefly. I cannot give you all the information. Of course, I'm writing a book right now. 
about the business that I followed, that I developed when I ran the escort agency I had in Orange County, which was called OC Fund. So it's a lot of information, okay? It's probably gonna end up being about 250, 300 page book. And uh, I, I'm trying to give as much information as possible how, about how I did it. And this is by no means me promoting prostitution. Let's just get the legal part out of the way. I'm not promoting anything illegal. I never would. I don't even want to jaywalk. This is just about information that I used when I was in the business just, to, just for information purposes only. Okay. So the escorts, I had certain pre-qualifications when I was screening to see if I'm going to hire a certain person or not. Uh, I had different rules and I started with my ads that I put out to attract the right person. So the ad itself, it was written in a way where I was able to pre-screen the people that were curious or interested in being an escort. And I always put in that they had to be over 21, they had to love uh, being intimate with men, they had to have something positive to do with the money, uh, they had to be a hard worker, all the good character traits you, you look for in any employee, uh, loyal, dedication, honesty, integrity, all these things, trustworthy. And of course they have to look good because the type of business we're in, it depends uh, primarily on looks first. And that's what attracts the client first. They see a picture or video and they just call or text or email. So uh, looks were very, very important, much much so part of it. And uh, so after the, uh, the emails that I got from uh, the response to the, to the ads that I put out in order to recruit and select escorts for my business, I moved on to the telephone. If I liked the person, everything checks out. They looked good. They had all these character traits. I spoke with them a little bit briefly over the email, maybe two or three emails back and forth. Then I would talk to them over the phone and I would feel them out. And that's where my gut comes in. I ask the right questions. I listen to the answers. I'm very, very active listener. So I really listened carefully to what they were saying. And I was able to decipher it right then and there, maybe between one and three calls and just wait in a different day and calling again and so far and so forth, maybe give them a little assignment and see how they do it. And then when I was really sure about this is sound like the person I want to hire and 99% of the time when I, made a face-to-face -face appointment to meet with the applicant, I ended up hiring them. It's very, very rarely that I did not hire the person that I met face-to-face -face with. So I pretty much knew for sure that I was going to hire them. And of course, face-to-face -face was the final uh, method that I used, which is looking at uh, the, their eyes, the body language, the facial features, how they answer the, the, the questions, how comfortable they are or uncomfortable they are when I showed them the calendar and what kind of uh, traffic that we had and what kind of clients we had and I showed them the numbers, the actual dollar amounts and stuff like this. Now, sometimes even if I hired the right person, I did not think that it was the right person for the job emotionally and psychologically. And I think I explained that in the book and I explained it in other videos, meaning even if it, they checked all the boxes for me, as far as being the right person for the job, uh, when they actually did it, and a lot of people, you don't know until you try, you know that old saying, it is so true in this situation because they did not know, and I did not know how they're gonna react. Even though we did the POV video, which is a GFE, triple X video with myself, they were fine with it, they were fine and they were happy. Uh, however, they, when it came down to actually being on the first day with few clients, it was a little different ball game. And that's why I always say this, this job is not for everybody. Not everybody can handle that, especially emotionally. Because we, we are pretty much emotional beings. So maybe one out of a hundred uh, this happened to, and uh, basically they just could not handle it. And I just let them go. And, and to explain to them and advise them that uh, they shouldn't really do it for any money on earth because it's not going to be good for them. So that's what the screen is pretty much basic screen. And of course, there's a lot more involved, but this is just basically the screening I used 
on our screen and the escorts. And you'll find more uh, detail in my book, uh, Madam Suzanne, that's on Amazon, and also the new book, which is going to be called How I Made a Million Dollars a Year as an Upscale Escort, which basically is true, which a lot of my escorts did make that kind of money. And I was just a facilitator in between and I was behind the scene, guiding them through and holding their hand the whole way. Now, screening clients, this is pretty much the holy grail of our business. I cannot tell you how many times I've been asked, how do you screen your clients? And this is the $64,000 question, or in my case, it's the million dollar a year question. <clears throat> I split my screening system into two categories, and I explained that in my new book, more in detail, of course. And the category one is basically the A, B, and C guide on how to screen the client from the first contact all the way until they meet the escort, okay? And I explain that in detail in the book that I'm writing right now. I'm almost finished with it. The second category is more of an intuition, a built-in gut instinct that is developed from years and years and years of feeling millions of calls and also conventional real life experiences with business and people. And that's something you can't really teach. That's something that you develop, something you have a knack for naturally, or do you develop over time and space and experience? The first category, which is the uh, guide, it was very, very um, systematic. In other words, I had the right software in place when I walked in my office in the morning I would have several screens open. One would be on the all my ads, uh, my, my ads website like Eero, City Vibe, Backpage, whatever website advertising uh, website I used for my ads. So that would be on there because I had to constantly push the available now button because it was all geared towards who is available now. And the clients looked at that. So that was constant all day long. And like also in Backpage, when I use Backpage and I got some really good clients from there, you just got to make sure you screen them properly because there's a lot of junk on there. But you can decipher through that haystack to get some few diamonds, which I did. Uh, with the Backpage, it was different. It was constant posting to the top of the list because they were, they were so busy that once I got 15 or 20 down the list of my ads, I went and bumped them up again. You can only do that once an hour. So what I would do is I would uh, schedule on the hour, they have this, uh, this feature where you can schedule on the hour, every hour to bump those ads up to the top of the category, which was the escort category in my case. Uh, that was one tab that I opened. Another tab I opened was for like TER, the eroticreview.com, which is a review website. It's kind of like Yelp for restaurants and businesses and stuff like this on the uh, mainstream site. Uh, and uh, I used that because a lot of the clients that I screened, they were uh, members of the community of hobbyists that wrote reviews and read reviews about all escorts in all different areas. So uh, I wanted to make sure that I used that website as a paid member to check on uh, different clients that they give me their username and the escorts they've seen, which I could verify. And of course, their whitelist, which means that the escorts actually vouch for them on the website. So that was a good tool as well. Another thing I did is I, um, I had a tab open for phonevalidator.com, which is the website I used at the time to reverse look up on the phone just to see not who owns it or who is who's it registered to or what have you. It was really more, more to see like what kind of phone line is it? Is it a... Is it AT&T, is it uh, Verizon, T-Mobile, Sprint, or is it a landline? And if so, does it go back to a company? Uh, is it a VOIP, voice over internet protocol, meaning like Google Voice? Uh, is it um, um, Magic Jack used to be popular back then with some people? Uh, and, and those are the things that I look for using the phonevalidator.com. So I just wanted to make sure what kind of phone I'm dealing with. Reason being is I never accepted calls from someone that was using any type of voice over internet protocol because they were masking who they were. And my whole purpose is to figure out who this person really is. So that did not really help the cause. So I always kindly 
texted them back if they, it was a text or called them back uh, and uh, let them know that please, I need you to call me from a, a regular phone line that I can actually verify. Another tab that I had open was the actual, my own, my own website, which is OC Fund website because I was constantly updating stuff on there. So I wanted to make sure that I have everything all set and just in case if one of the escorts did not show up, I can upload uh, the escort that was gonna be working for that day because I had a certain system for that as well, which is who was working for that day and from what time to what time. In our case, mostly it was 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. Hey, Mr. International, how you doing? Uh, <clears throat> to be honest with you, um, that is okay. I never really used that because I, um, I did not really feel comfortable, of course, myself being a guy and I was Madam Suzanne, so that would not have worked for me because I was doing all the screening. So none of the escorts actually have the phones to screen themselves. So if you're an independent, you can do that. But one thing for sure, I never ever uh, relied on just one, just one aspect of screening. In other words, I always had to have three or more different resources to check on someone. Uh, it couldn't be just TR by itself. It couldn't be just uh, a, a reverse lookup on Intellius or uh, uh, or any of the other websites that checked out on phones or, or like background checks and stuff like this. It couldn't have been just LinkedIn or P411. That's another website that verified whitelisted clients, they called them. So I always made sure I had at least three or more different resources to check on the client. And the reason being is, is if you relied on one thing, let's say a lot of, a lot of providers back then they used to rely on references. So they thought that because they asked the client for two references from other providers or escorts they saw, and if their escorts vouch for this, uh, this particular client, then it was okay. Well, I'm here to tell you, and I write, and write about this in, in my book here that I'm writing right now. Uh, there was an incident in Vegas where, when I was working in Las Vegas, uh, there was a couple of girls that got arrested. And the first thing that law enforcement does when they arrest a woman is they grab their phone, right? So now they have control over their phone. So what the cops started doing, and of course I figured it out pretty much right away, just because I do not count on one thing, one resource for, for my screening process. What they were doing is they were uh, posing as a client, of course, and that's their whole idea is to device cop is to pose as a client and try to get an appointment and meet with the escorts and bust her, right, for prostitution. So what they were doing is they were actually using those two girls that they got busted, their phone, which they had control with, and the girls would uh, ask the undercover cop, okay, give me two references, and undercover cop will give them those two references that they have their phone in possession and their control over the, the phone themselves. So the unsuspecting escort that's checking on the supposed client that was really an undercover cop, uh, they would call, uh, and most of the time they actually texted at the time because you know nobody was going to answer the phone, or they'll have a female cop answer these phones as these escorts. And the girl was just asked them, you know, you saw so and so, how was he? And of course, they said, oh, this guy was a great guy. He was really generous. You know, he's very easy, and all the right keywords for the escort to go ahead and, and book him. And what happened was they got a lot of people arrested that way because the escorts that just relied on that one resource for their screening process or screening system failed miserably as they never checked to make sure that, hey, let's, let me check on, on something else. So what do you do for a living? You know, uh, oh, you're a doctor, okay, so you know, what's your name? And you can go on AMA, for example, I use American Medical Association website and I check them because any type of licensed profession, and this is one of the main reasons why I only chose to work with professionals that had to be licensed, like real estate agents, doctors, attorneys, therapists, psychologists, dentists, all these type of people, the professionals, they're all licensed by the state or the feds or both, some of them, 
So they were really, really easy for me to, to check out. So on the attorney side, I used to use martindale.com, which would tell you exactly what college they went to, how old they are, what kind of degree they have, what kind of line, uh, uh, field of, of law they practice, and so forth and so forth, and their license number. And the same thing with the, the doctors or the surgeons or whatever on the American Medical Association website, because they all, all had to be licensed by, by that association. So Mr. International, I hope that answered your question. I would never rely just on one thing. And as you saw, she's a very nice lady. She's very young and very inexperienced. So at some point, some slick cop is gonna come up and do the face to face and act all normal and nice and hey, how you doing and all this stuff. And guess what? She's gonna book him. And then guess what? She's gonna be in trouble. Just like the guy that, if you notice on the, on the interview, she said the guy acted like he was a cop. He just wanted to basically do it for free and he got his refund. So, so I would be careful if I was her, but you know, I can't really say anything. I can't advise her because it's not legal for me to do so. I don't wanna come across like I'm you know, promoting prostitution or trying to help them that's aiding and abetting. So I stay away from all that. Um, so this is why I'm writing this book of how I did it. I can always talk about what I did when I was in the business and how I screened. So going back to the tabs, uh, I already talked about Martindale because I had a lot of, I had five or 600 uh, attorneys. So I would use martindale.com to check on them, make sure that they are licensed and they are who they say they are. It's very, very, it was very, very easy for me to screen a real client because the real client that's been around and all, all the gentlemen I looked for were like over 40, between 40 and 60, 65. Uh, they all, they've been there before. They already know what the, what the escort needs for that for her to trust them behind closed doors and you know i did not really fight anybody o o on it if i had to just overcome an objection i did it once or twice which means hey listen you know i understand that you're concerned about your safety concerned about discretion i get it you know you're married you have a life you have a profession i don't want nothing to happen to you but at the same time you have to understand the flip side of that point is that if i'm going to let you come in and remember i'm talking this as if I was the escort, okay, using the voice changer, hence why this whole thing is called Madame Suzanne. So he's talking to the escort and she's telling him, look, I understand where you're coming from. However, you can understand where I'm coming from. I'm a little 120 pound, you know, five foot four, 23 year old, beautiful girl that lives by herself. And I'm gonna invite you into my home. Would you let somebody into your home unless you know who they, who they, are? they are, especially do you expect to be intimate with me within two minutes or less? So most of the time, of course, 99% of the time, the kind of client that I targeted understood that and they, they gave up all the information that I needed because I, I was able to convince them really nicely and eloquently that, you know what, I'm not trying to hurt you. I'm not trying to do anything that's negative for you or for your life. I'm just trying to basically make sure that you're safe so I can have you welcome you into my home because we worked out of, in Orange County, I had the in-call locations. And these guys didn't know that if nobody lived there or whatever, they just knew that it was where the escort would be. So that basically worked 99% of the time. Now, there was uh, some situations where you could tell that the person it was just not gonna give up the information. And I have always had the 1% rule, which is one of my 10 commandments but that I wrote for myself in this business, which says if I have a 1% doubt that the client is not safe, 1%, that's all I needed. I let him go. And this is the main reason why I've never had a girl get in trouble through my screening system. In other words, I never booked a client as a law enforcement officer or a, a rapist or a killer or just any type of person I'm trying to rob the girls or whatever, anything type of negative. It never, I never let it go through my screening system because I caught all the red flags in advance as I really paid attention, I really listened to everything and I, I checked on everything. Uh, I had 10 different ways to check on somebody and I believe me, I utilized all and some of my own to check to make sure that the person is uh, not just law enforcement, that's easier to, to, to screen for. Uh, they talk a certain way, they're very quiet, uh, they have that authority uh, in their voice that they can't shake. Uh, they want you to talk, they don't wanna give out information and, and if you ask them, you know, what do you do? I work for Oakley. Okay, what do you do for Oakley? I'm a manager. Well, what exactly do you do? They get stuck because it's not what they do. 
you already know if your job is a certain thing, you're very proficient at it. Look at me talking about what I did, you know? I know it inside and out because I lived it, I actually did it. If somebody is pretending to be somebody else, they cannot talk in specifics about no matter what it is. So uh, that was that was really easy to uh, to screen for. Another easy person to screen for, which was pretty much over, honestly, over 70 or 80% of the calls, which is what I call time wasters, right? Time wasters are people that cannot afford the $500 an hour or $1,000 an hour, whatever the escort is, is charging. And uh, they will just uh, get on the phone and just want to talk. A lot of them were, you know, excuse my French, they were rankers. So they were just using the, the pictures or the videos they were they're looking at online. They can never afford the 500 bu bucks an hour. They probably didn't have that in their account, which is okay. But I just it just didn't didn't coincide with my system because I was one person. I had a lot of calls to make, so I'm not in there to accommodate uh, these kind of calls. And that wasn't what the business is for. So I, I knew within usually three to five seconds that that person, the way they they breathe, the way they talk, they said, "Hey, baby, hey, sexy," all this stuff. Uh, from trial and error, which I've given them a lot of chances before, I knew that when somebody started the conversation with those kind of terms and a certain uh, certain voice and breathing and all this stuff, you could tell it's like click. And I always save them into my contact list under do not uh, answer or I block them, depending on the phones I had, if I was able to block them right away. And I also had an advantage because I'm working with several people at the same time. So if I'm fielding 12 different girls, the escorts for that one day, because I ended up with 12 different places. So I'm booking for 12 different people. So as the calls are coming in, if a time waster called phone number one, and, the, and then when, when I got hung up on them and they went to call, stop calling, they go down the list usually and call phone number two or three or four, I already know who this person is because they just called phone number one. So I only had to endure the mistake once, which is wasting three to five seconds or 10 seconds or whatever it is. And so that's, that's really how I, I, I screened. This is just a basic thing about my screening system. Now, and that was the category one, which is just a process I followed through until I got to the decision A or B. A, yes, book them, and B, no, I, I do not feel safe. I do not feel comfortable with them let him go. And I was always fine with that because I always said to myself, okay, next. Meaning just because I let this guy go, it doesn't mean that there isn't a hundred guys waiting in line. That's one thing that we have, we, we had in our business uh, when I, when I was involved is that there was never a shortage of clients. That's one great thing about this business is, you know, it's, it's a nature thing. Men are going to do it. They're always going to call. They have a, a certain, um, need natural need we're wired a certain way even though they're could be in love with their wife to death and i've talked to had several several heart-to-heart -heart conversations and, and deep substance conversations with a lot of my clients of course as madam suzanne and they confided in me and told me how much they love their wives how much they love their kids they don't never want anything to happen they never wanted to find out because they don't want to hurt them they don't want to lose them and i really believe them so it was just something one of those things that I think it's a wiring thing. And I talk about that in my book, of course, uh, Madam Suzanne, where it's really, I really believe after 30 years in this business that it's just a wiring thing. And some women are wired that way too. Don't get me wrong. I've had girls that I, that I worked with uh, escorts that were just as bad, you know, and it's not bad, it's just as uh, horny, I guess, or they were nymphos and they would have done it for free. So those, you know, th they were wired also that way. So. Uh, you know, I'm no, no, not here to judge anybody. It is what it is. I've had a lot of uh, clients that were uh, sex addicts and they didn't even know it. Um, so, yeah, so that was one, one part of the screening system. Now, the other part is the gut instinct. Mr. Intentional asks, how did you get the clients to open up like that? Most just hung up and got scared immediately. Um no, I never really had any problems. Remember, I was using a voice changer, right? So they thought they were talking to Madam Suzanne, a sophisticated, middle-aged, Newport Beach um, socialite, okay? And that's the image I portrayed uh, behind the scenes. 
And I was very, very, um, uh, very kind, very nice, uh, funny. I'm a conversationalist anyways by nature, so it was easy for me to start a conversation with anybody and make them feel at ease. It's just one of those um, natural talents I've had all my life. You know, I'm a natural salesman. So it really helped a lot to put somebody at ease, especially on the first conversation. Uh, and just, you know, I'm just having a little conversation with somebody, you know, like three to five minutes was tops what I needed when I was screening, you know, clients. Remember, I'm working with 12 people at the same time uh, today. So if today was when I was working, not today, I'm not working today, of course, so I'm retired, obviously. But when I was working and I ended up with 12 places, so I have 12 people to book, right? And I started my day at 8 o'clock in the morning. We start our, our business hours were 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. Monday to Friday, right? So it was very, very important for me to book everyone at least from 11 to three or four, because I wanted to make sure that the, the escorts went home with at least thousand to $2,000 every day in six or seven hours. In order for me to accomplish that goal, I had to work on booking them at least anywhere from six to eight clients a day in order for them to go home with a couple of thousand in their pocket. Because at the time we split everything 50-50, right? So I can only spend three or five minutes, between three and five minutes with, with a client, but I did a lot of things behind the scene before I even picked up the phone. In other words, I used software uh, to check on, do a reverse check on the phone. I had to uh, use other techniques, uh, doing, doing, using different softwares like I talked about, using LinkedIn, using uh, the erotic review, using P411. Whatever it is is that client giving me information, I had to fact check that, right? So it's just a matter of doing a quick investigation. And when you're really, when you're really proficient at anything you do, you get to be really, really fast and really good. And I just was able to do that. And, and luckily, thank God, uh, even though I don't like texting in my personal life because I don't think it's a, the right communication method, uh, a lot of things get lost in translation. But in that business, it really saved me because if I have 20 phones in front of me, there is no way on earth, no matter how good I was, and no matter how good anybody is, to be able to have conversations with separate people at the same time. But texting really allowed me to do that. In other words, I could be talking to this person on this phone and on this phone and this phone, this phone, and actually texting. And I I'm really organized. I use a lot of uh, templates because questions are always asked the same questions over and over again. So I have templates on all the phones and everything, all the phones were copied the same way or very duplicate down to the last template or picture or whatever. And I was just able to just click and use templates for all the questions. I can stop pre-screening right away. Yeah, so, yeah, it's one of those that you just uh, you just do and end up, have, as long as you have a good system in anything you do and follow it to the T as much as you can, then you, you, you can't fail. And that's why they have systems in place, whether it's business systems or engineering or Whatever, whatever you're talking about, they always have to have a system in order to be proficient, efficient, and successful on it. So I never had really an issue of somebody hanging up unless they, um, they were full of it and it didn't matter, then they can just go away. So I usually did the hanging up, to be honest with you. Okay, I hope that answered the question. So going back to the second category of the screening, which is the gut instinct that you develop over years of doing whatever it is that you're doing uh, and intuition, which is built uh, through experience, uh, through life, people, communication skills, all of these come in play, right? So I always had that gut, look, when I talk to somebody and I, and I do it today also, as far as like, even just in my personal life or my business life, you know, I can tell pretty much if somebody is being honest or being deceitful or it's just, just the way they talk and, you, you pose the right questions to them and see how they react and how they answer you back, you know? It's, it's very important to be a, an active listener, meaning you really listen. You do not just listen while you're thinking in your brain about what you, how you're going to respond or what answer, what question you're going to give or what answer you're going to give. Really active listening is very important. You really want to be in tune with that person. And that really saved my butt, excuse my French, many times because something did not feel right. And I learned to listen to my gut instinct. 
So that was something that uh, part of the screen that I can't really teach. You know, uh, you either have it through life's experiences and through your uh, personal character traits and being a, a, an effective communicator and efficient communicator and, and a good listener comes in play. So all these things combined, they make for a better a screener. Uh, yeah, so that's about it. Uh, I just uh, really go in details in the book that I'm finishing right now, which I, hopefully I'll be have it published by the end of the month, beginning of next month. Uh, but I go into detail on how I really screened uh, day by day. Uh, and I really break it down to the last website I used, uh, the text templates I used, just everything. I, I break it down psychologically and and literally. So um, that's about it for today. If there's any other questions, <clears throat> so anyways, um, so it's just basically being in tune with people and listening and uh, communicating properly on a good level, just like any other relationship, whether it's business or um, personal or love, you know, whatever relationship it is, you know, communication is very important. So there's got to be uh, something to be said about being an effective communicator in any business you're in. It's very, very important. Right? How do you get the girl to not give out their personal number? Okay, so that goes back to screening as well, right, Mr. International? So when I was screening the escorts, I wanted to make sure that it's somebody that actually listened to me because remember, I, in Orange County, I only hired escorts that never done this before, right? And that was by design because I wanted to train them properly how I want to train them the right way. So I could only work with certain kind of people. And one of those things that character traits that I looked for was honesty and integrity, right? So, and I would tell the, the, the girls or the escorts before they started, I said, look, there's been a lot of people I've worked with thousands of escorts before you. And I've worked with some really good ones. And I've worked with some good shysters. And I worked with some good hustlers in the past. Very, very street smart, street wise girls. Some of them were pretty much almost better than me. And I would tell the new escort that I hired in Orange County, look, you might be able to get away with it once or twice or three times. Somehow, it always gets back to me, one way or another. And, and here's what I want to tell you. If you do that, if you're going to be making two or $300,000 for the next six months, I can get you in and get you out. If you do that and I catch you, there's no second chances. That's it. Once you break that trust... Trust is like a nice, clean slate piece of paper, right? You have some nice writing on it. Once you crumble that piece of paper, no matter how much you try to strain it out, guess what happens? It's still going to be crumbled. It's never going to be the same again. And this is what I used to, to tell the, the escorts. You can probably get away with it once or twice, but sooner or later I will find out. And then is it worth that extra $500 or $1,000 or $2,000? for you to lose the $300,000 that you could have made. So is it worth your opportunity cost? And most of them were honest and I, I made sure that I, I uh, screened them and I made sure I hired the right people. However, as you know, Mr. International, nobody's perfect, right? And there's always gonna be that person that is gonna try to do extra services and not let me know. They're gonna try to do, uh, to give out their phone number just to um, cut me out, out of the middle. In fact, I'm going to give you a, a little a quick story here. So I had this really nice girl. She was from New Jersey. She was a fitness model. Go gorgeous girl, red hair, green eyes, beautiful knockout body, totally, totally fit, and she really loved sex. So she really took care of the clients. She did a great job, and I trusted her. So I had one of her clients that used to, and I, and I can see the pattern with clients. Remember, I studied the client's pattern, pattern as well. So I noticed this client, they used to see other girls stop seeing everybody else and just focus on this one here, right? A fitness model. So uh, he, kept, he kept seeing her like two or three, four times a week. So one time he, he, he called me, called Madam Suzanne, and he, uh, he asked if he could take her to Las Vegas. And I told him, okay, so he wanted to take a Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So I went through with the with the rates, which was 
$3,000 a day. So it came up to $9,000. And I told him, you know what, I'll give you a break. Let me ask her first, make sure she's okay with it. And I'll give you a break, you know, maybe, you know, 8,000 or something like this for three days. Since it's Vegas, it's not that far and he's a good client. Um, so what happened was, I don't hear back from the guy. I could tell that he wasn't about to pay just his reaction when I, when I, when I told him the, the rate. I could tell he was not ready to pay that rate or he doesn't want to pay that rate. So fast forward about two weeks. I don't hear anything back from this, this gentleman. And uh, I find out from her, she calls me one day and she's all upset and crying and all this stuff. And I'm like, what's going on? She goes, I cannot believe it. He gave me $1,000. This is the same girl that was not supposed to go behind my back, right? She said, he gave me $1,000 um, for the three days. And he was really rude and he did not, did not treat me right. He did not do anything um, like he was supposed to do and all this stuff. Um, so I, I, I asked, I said, you know what? It's really interesting because here you are telling me a story about this client that you were not even supposed to see behind my back, right? And you're complaining about getting $1,000 from this guy that you're not supposed to see unless it went through me. So lesson learned. This is why you always keep me in the middle because that would never happen with me because I would have gotten you the money you're supposed to get and we would have gotten it in advance. And then I would have made sure that this doesn't happen because I have 30 years experience and you have three months experience. So that's lesson learned. That's number one. Number two, I said, unfortunately now I have to fire you. I have to let you, let you go. What do you mean? I was honest with you about, I said, no, I, I hate to tell you this, but you just showed me your character trait, which is I cannot trust you because you already went behind my back. Your actions already showed me where you're at, what's important to you. You going with that client behind my back was more important that you're in our relationship for us to get you to where you're supposed to be and then move on with your life. So that's another example of, you know, dishonesty and stuff like this. But you know, I've had few, like in, in Orange County, I probably fired five or six girls over a four and a half year period, whether they give the number to a client or they um, did something behind my back, but they were doing extras and not letting me know because we're supposed to, uh, we were supposed to, the deal was to split everything in half that came in, in our business, right? So anything that came in as far as like uh, total sales or total revenue was split 50-50 and the extras was part of that, right? Because I sold a lot of extras too for the girls. So of course, you know, you have to just stick with the, with the plan and be honest about it. So it just depends on, on the person and how honest they are. And to be honest with you, I used to believe in second chances. Unfortunately, certain character traits like honesty, integrity, and loyalty, those things, they're either embedded in you, they're not. They're either embedded in you at a young age, at least this is what I believe. And you cannot go from a disloyal person all your life, all of a sudden, like, wake up one morning and go, oh, guess what? I think I want to be loyal today. It doesn't work that way. It's something, it's a value that's embedded in you. And it's something that you cannot improve as much as you try to work on, you know, a lot of times nature takes its course and that's your nature. And it's just not, not, not something that you can work on. Like, for example, like I worked on my self-worth issues and anger issues that I had in the past and I was able to work through them. And it's not easy. Sometimes I still have to, you know, make sure I, I, I keep up on my um, development and my growth and everything. You know, I'm still, I'm still taking classes myself for like self-help classes for, for anger management and, and uh, criminal thinking and stuff like this. So some things you can work on, I believe in, and some things that are character trait, like example, another example is the work ethic, right? Uh, I've never seen a lazy person all of a sudden decided to be not lazy, right? Or I've never seen a really hardworking person that became a lazy person. That's a work ethic that's built inside of you at a young age. I've always been the same way. And I'm sure, you know, you can relate uh, you know, just from being a young, young person to now, if you've been a hard worker, guess what? You're always going to be a hard worker. And one of my billionaire clients actually taught me this about second chances because I used to give a lot of second chances. And you know what? Every single time I got disappointed because the person that I gave the second chance to, to whatever they did, whether they stole or lied or whatever, they did it again. I had this Russian girl that I gave her a second chance. She was doing all the extras. 
and never told me. Not one extra she told me over like a year period. And I'm sitting there and I'm watching and I know the clients have told me that she's doing extras. And that's why they kept going to her because they did reviews and everything. And I wrote, I, and I read, read the reviews and I know what she's doing. I just stayed, stayed quiet. And then and she was really, really good at her job. So after one year, I finally sat down with her. I said, look, I know what you're doing. She started crying, apologizing. I said, I'm going to give you one chance. And guess what? She did it again. So I had to let it go. So this one billionaire client of mine, uh, very, very successful, uh, worth, you know, three or four billion dollars at the time, three or four. Uh, very successful. He's is, uh, is very, uh, he's a celebrity in the business world. And he told me, he said, look, I used to get second chances, but certain things you just can't because they're going to do it again. And you know what? He's 100% right. And another thing I'll tell you, Mr. International, is I actually tested these girls. Uh, what I did was, is I will, I have certain clients that I use that would do this for me. And I did favors for them, you know, um, like I would give them, you know, breaks on rates and stuff like this. So I'll give them free rate or free session once in a while. And I, I paid for that from out of my pocket because the girl still always made her part, her money that came out of my, my side. Uh, I would send them and if I'm not sure about a person, I'll have them, you know, offer bareback full service for five grand or 10 grand, which is doing intercourse without condom, which is, which is a no-no in my book, right? It's not safe. It's not cool. It, it could jeopardize someone's health, both people's health, the client and the escort, and it will just jeopardize the whole operation. It's just not cool at all to do that. So I would, I would send clients and I would uh, have them offer the girls exuberant amount of money to see if they'll do it, right? So, uh, and I had, I had my certain clients, I had about a dozen clients that I could do that with, with new, especially newer girls if I wasn't sure and I wanted to test them. So I would just send them in, kind of like the unknown shopper or like the unknown eater or whatever. I will send them in and just check the girl out, see if, uh, if she's good at what she does. And we, I, I'll send the client with certain instructions because I was focused on one area, which is like, let's say if it was honesty with a certain escort, I would tell them, okay, off, I want you to offer, you know, $300 or $500 for this extra service. Let's say if she did anal. Okay, I'll offer another $500 for anal. Or try to negotiate down and tell her, you know, don't tell Madam Suzanne, you know, and let's see what she says. And, you know, it, it felt really good when the escort texted me right away and said, you know, this client told me, or when they left, told me, you know, not to tell you that, you know, he was offering me this and this and this. And I said, okay, I'll talk to the client and I'll deal with it. I might have to let him go, you know. So it felt really good when I had a really honest person like this. So I had my own little, you know, little tricks of the trade, if you will, that I learned over the years to, to use uh, in order to keep everybody honest. So, yeah. But, but for the most part, people are honest. And people want to do the right thing. But it all goes back, when we go back to a full circle here, to screening. Everything in life is about screening. You know, if you know how to screen your friends, your acquaintances, your business partners, your colleagues, your coworkers, your lovers, uh, and that starts from day one, right? If you're looking for certain things, you just got to be very aware, very self-aware, and very aware of them. And look at what they're doing and why they're doing it. So it's, it's very, very important to always, we're constantly screening, right? Like when I'm looking at you right now, and you're asking me certain questions, I'm really screening you, just like you're screening me, you're looking at me, right? So I'm going, okay, Mr. International is asking me these questions, right? So that tells me something about you, certain questions that you're asking, right? I know what your interest is, I know why, you, you know, pretty much why you're asking and stuff like this. So it's all part of really screening without even knowing that we're screening, you know? Just like when you see somebody and you might think, okay, he's got grease on his uh, on his clothes and stuff, and you're screening him going, oh, okay, well, he must be a mechanic, you know? So we're always screening one way or another, you know? It's just the way it is. And if, if you're self-aware and you're smart and you're, uh, you're in touch with what's around you, then you'll do a better job and you'll have uh, a lot less failed relationships or burned bridges than if you don't. So it's always a good idea to keep things uh, open. Screening becomes an art. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Screening is an art. And uh, I could actually write a whole book about just screening. In fact, the book I'm writing right now, I would say about 30% of it is the screening section. Because that's the number one question I get asked. I've been asked for, for the last 20 some years since I got online in 98. Uh, people are always asking me, how do you screen? I used to tell them, look, 
I screamed very, very carefully uh, because I didn't want to, you know, uh, they say the uh, the game is to be told, uh, sold and not told, right? So this is, uh, this is one of the, that was a, a, a profession kind of secret of how I screen because not, you just want to just go and, and, I, and I've helped a lot of people in the past, you know, people that I helped them go independent and go on their own. I know a couple of them still in the business and have done really well. So I've always tried to help, but uh, it's, you know, it's just something that you don't, it's a trade secret. You don't want to just go and tell everybody, you know? Um, so yeah, so uh, this book should come out hopefully at the end of the month, beginning of next month, and it will have all the details on how I did my um, my screening and how I developed this particular system for uh, the escort business in general from A to Z. You know, from the ads to the pictures to the hiring to uh, you know how to screen the clients, how to screen the escorts, uh, and uh, you know how to pick the in-call location, uh, you know where to where to pick it, why. Why did I pick um, a certain location? Uh, why did I, you know, um, decorate them a certain way? I mean, I go really to the uh, nitty gritty. I go down to the basis of everything. Why I thought and I did certain things a certain way. Uh, to know if you, okay, we got Anya. She's asking hi. I'm curious to know if you, I can't read. If you ever want to have a family of your own, kids and wife, in this area of work that you were? Very good question, Anya. So here is the answer. I've never ever been in a position to attract the partner that would have been a great life partner for me. Why? Because I've always had a conflict of, I was always conflicting. As much as I'm a family guy, believe it or not, I come from a very traditional family, Catholic family, old fashioned family. Um, old school, that they believe in marriage and kids and grandkids and doing the right thing. But however, as much as that my, that's my inner desire, that's where truly I am inside as far as values and desires and beliefs, the problem was that I, I felt conflicted because being in this line of work, in this field, it made it almost impossible, right? Because... I'm a very honest person. I had to be honest with myself. I'm like, how am I going to do this work here? Basically working at the factory, right? I don't want to say the P word, but it's the P factory, right? And how am I going to go home at the end of the day and be a father to kids? And even though, because I'm selling sex here, right? So I felt like a hypocrite. Like, how am I going to go over here and teach my kids, you know, good values and good morals and, you know, this is what this is the, the right way and this is the wrong way. Meanwhile, I'm doing this over here. So it's always been a conflict for me. So I've never been in the right place, uh, in the right headspace, emotional space, mind, mental, psychological space to want to have a family, even though I do want to now today. However, unfortunately, I'm turning 57 here on October 1st. So it's a little bit too late for me to start a family, but I, I am actively looking for a life partner for sure. Uh, someone that... I can share my life with, and uh, now that I'm no longer in that in that field, um, even though I'm doing, you know, the the, the script and the screenwriter is do, working on the screen thing for the movie and all this stuff, but that's just a movie and a, and documentary. Even though it's about this this business that I was in, but it's, I'm not actively doing that. I'm not doing videos every Saturdays with two or three girls, you know. Uh, I'm not. I'm not doing any of that stuff. So uh, now I think I might be in a good position to do that. So thank you for that. That's a good answer. <laughs> it's never too late. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. I mean, you know, to, you know, I just, I just don't want to be selfish because I figured if I had a son, you know, today or next year, right, it takes nine months. So let's say I have a son next year. So at 58, by the time they're 18, now I'm like 76. So. You know, you never want to be that kid at school with, with a great grandpa for a father, right? So it's, it won't be really fair because I've had friends when I was in school, middle school and, and high school, where their, their, their pops or their mom was really, really, you know, gray and old for us back then, especially. They looked really old. And, uh, you know, they got, they got a little, uh, not bullied, but, you know, they, they, they were made fun of and stuff. So I don't know. We'll see what happens. You know, no, never say never, right? You never know. 
So any other questions, guys? So we got hazy, hazy, nine, nine, seven, seven, the Joe Rogan experience. That's pretty interesting. Mr. International, any other questions? How you doing, Denver? I just noticed you're in here. Okay, so that's basically it, guys. It's uh, it's about um, what's your book coming out? Uh, when is your book coming out? Okay, the next one here that I'm working on. And as you can see, I wish I could show you right here. You're gonna laugh, you guys. Uh, when I was on vacation, I called vacation, right? When I was in locked up. So I, we didn't have access. I didn't even have access at the time to to a pen, right? So you can see it's long hand, but it's in pencil, right? So uh, I've been working on it all month and I should be done with it. It was already written, but I have to, of course, type it and edit it and, and do all the stuff to it, you know? Um, and then get it ready for publishing and stuff because I do everything myself. So, hey, what's up, Denver? So, God willing, uh, it should be done. I'm on on uh, track to hopefully get it published at the end of the month, if not the first week of next month. And um, it, like I said again, it's going to be called "How to Make How I Made a Million Dollars a Year as an high, as a High End Escort." And this basically is a system I use that I developed over the years to be really successful and make a really good income and get in and get out. And this is what I always preached. And I still preach today, get in, get out. One to three years, get out. Some people want to do five years. If you can handle it and you can stop at five years. Uh, I'm talking to somebody right now, been doing it 18 years. What are you waiting on? You're already a millionaire. You know, you already have all the money. You got all the toys, you got the house, you got the cars, you got investment properties. Time to go out. I mean, when, you know, you're 30, 38 years old. When are you going to start a family? When are you going to have a normal life, right? Because, you know, this is not easy to be in that lifestyle. It takes a lot out of you. It takes a lot of your, your family, your partners, your, your friends. You know, you can't really tell everybody what you're doing. It's, it, it takes its toll. So at some point you want to have, you want to just let, let your hair down and not look over your shoulder, especially it's still illegal in this country, unfortunately, which is something else that we're doing. We're trying to hopefully help is to make it at least start the conversation. I don't know if I'll see it in my lifetime, but I'm sure going to try to start the conversation about, if not legalization, decriminalization, something. Because it, it's, it's a long past due. And I might, t I might try to book about that, to be honest with you. I might give it away for free. That will be just the, the argument of why should it be legal. And I got to tell you, I got some good news for you guys. I just got contacted by one of the experts that used to work with me. And she told me that she is willing to go on camera and have an interview with me. So we're going to do an interview because so far you've been listening to my side of the story, right? I'm only one person telling you my side. So I figured it'll be really, really uh, fair, fair reporting, right? And interesting. It's really exciting for me because I finally can get someone on camera, on record to let you know from their point of view, from that's one of the experts that worked with me in Orange County, and I think she was with me for about a year and a half, year, year and a half, uh, tell you her side, from her side, how, how it was working with me. And if I'm, what, I'm what I've been telling you guys all along, what I put in my, my book, my first book, Madam Suzanne, if it's true or not. So this will be really interesting to see. And I'm not going to have a pre-interview with her. I'm not going to ask any questions beforehand. Everything I'm going to do is I'm going to do it, you know, on camera. It's not going to be live, but it's going to be on camera. And I'm not going to edit it. I'm just going to put it as is. Uh, I wish you could have made it today because I was trying to get her to make it today. But she's dealing with something out of state and she'll be back on Friday. So she said she'll, she'll, she can do it on Friday. So hopefully I'll be able to have it done and posted sometime Friday, if not Saturday at the latest. But, yeah, I'm really excited about that. That's going to be very interesting, at least for me, uh, because... You know, it shows that what I was telling you is really accurate because I, I have no reason to lie to you guys. So if we don't have any more questions, do we have any more questions? Anybody? You can ask me anything you want. Denver, any questions? Anya, Mr. International. 
Hazy, hazy. Not yet? Okay. <laughs> All right. All right, so um, I guess that's, I will have, okay. <laughs> All right, I'll talk to you in person, Denver. So uh, thank you so much, you guys. I really, really appreciate you coming here. And I promise you, everything is in the work. Oh, one more. Okay, Mr. International, I have another question. Go ahead, Mr. International. We're all waiting. He's typing it. Uh, as he's typing it, let me just tell you this. Uh, I'm actively, uh, I, I got I, I got to tell you another, another good news this week. I couldn't believe it's Sunday. Okay, let me read this question by Mr. International. How do you stop other providers from taking your escorts? How do I stop other providers from taking my escorts? You mean like other, like agents and stuff like this? Uh, all I can tell you is this. I've never had the issue, at least not that I know of. It's because I created such a positive and safe environment and I became agents. Okay. So the question is, how do I stop other agents from taking my escorts? Okay. Fair question. Here's the way I looked at it. So I, all I could do is all I have control over is myself, right? And my actions. So what I've always done is I've always created the best environment. Safety is everything to me. So I've, I've, I've always embedded that in everybody I worked with. So I made sure it's safe. The environment is safe, private, discreet. I made sure I protected the identity of my escorts and my clients. And obviously I did not give up my list. That's why I ended up going to the big house for 38 months because they wanted the list and I would have been out on probation, but I wasn't going to do that, right? Uh, I really believe in this. So if you trust me, I'm going to protect you all the way through. I'm, I'm just that guy. I'm that old-fashioned and I, I don't want anybody to do that to me. So I'm always practicing the golden rule. You know, you treat people like you want to be treated. So that being said, I created the best environment. I was really fair with them and they made really good money and they had the best clients. In my humble opinion, I had the best clients working with me, right? And I really handpicked them. I mean, they're all pretty much VIPs. Like in Orange County, the DA's office said, I didn't count them. They said I had over 8,600 clients. Uh, I think I had about, probably about 2,200, to be honest with you, uh, between 2,000 and 2,200, what I call VIPs, which means the cream of the crops. Those are the guys that every escort would dream about having 100 of them. And I had 2,200 of them, or something like this. But of course, I was working with 65 escorts at a time, right? That's what I needed to be able to fulfill 12 locations every day. Um, and there's one, one person in each location. They only work two or three days a week. So if you do the math, I needed that many people. And sometimes people called in sick or they couldn't make it or they had to take a couple of weeks off as far as escort. So all I could do was create the best environment for them, right? And make them the best money and have the best clients and have them feel appreciated and respected. Even though the clients came in to pay them to do what we sold, which is girlfriend experience. Not one time did a client try to disrespect Madam Suzanne, the operation or the escort. And if there even was a hint of disrespect or mistreatment or whatever, believe me, I fired more clients than I fired escorts in the four and a half years I worked in Orange County. So that's all I did. Uh, I, not that I know of, to be honest with you, that anybody has ever uh, went with somebody else. And, you know, if somebody came up to me and said, uh, you know, I, uh, I found somebody else that's going to give me more money, I'm going to make more money, go for it. I was very confident because I knew nobody else was making, like in Orange County, for example, nobody was making 50 and 60 grand a, a month as far as a total revenue uh, for somebody. And they, they, the escorts made between 20 and 30,000 take home a month, right? That's working two or three days a week because I only let them work no more than three days a week out of five. And that's because I don't want them to burn out, right? I was always thinking about them. Uh, so that was collectively between forty and 50000 a month we brought in because I took half, right? They gave me half. And I paid the, the, the bills and all the bills and all the everything associated with that. So I ended up with about maybe maybe 30 35% tops uh, of the – so the, the, basically the escort, one by one, they were making more money than me. Because if, if an escort brought 30000 a month, uh, that means that uh, I took 30000 a month that month. She, she kept all 30,000, no expenses. I ended up taking 30,000 minus 15,000 or whatever in expense in between the rent and the ads and, and the utilities and everything else associated with the business, you know, all the expenses. So, so I treated them really good. And uh, 
I try to do my best to be the best person I can be with them. I give them a lot of advice, you know, basically I turned to uncle, uncle Freddie here and, um, always made sure that I was the best person I can be in. And then, you know, like everything else, uh, most employees, uh, beside the money, they want to be appreciated when they do a survey about what employees look for in a job. And I've always appreciated them, always told them all the positive affirmations after every day of work. Uh, I made sure uh, around Christmas, whoever was working with me, uh, they got nice gifts ready with a nice card that I wrote myself really, really sincerely. Uh, and honestly, about how I felt about them, I left them a really nice gift. Some some years it was a Michael Kors watch. Some years it was a, a, not a Louis Vuitton bag because that would have been too expensive for me for 65 people, right? Uh, but it would be like a coach or something, something for like $300, $400. Uh, so, yeah, so I, I, I let them know that I appreciate them and that I really uh, cared about them. And I try to help them outside of work with any, any other challenge they may have, whether it's fixing their credit or renting a house or, you know, um, I had three three women that ended up owning their own business. I helped them with their business plan and all the stuff, whatever I could help them with to become a successful entrepreneur. So I just try to do the best I can. And I think uh, I think they like being around because it wasn't just about me using them to make money off their body. It was never like that, you know? All right, any other questions? All right, so I was contacted. I'll, gi I'll give you this other thing. I was contacted by, by a huge celebrity. I had to really look at it and check and make sure it's a, it's a real real account right through Twitter. And I couldn't believe it. They liked what I was doing on Twitter, and they started following me on Twitter. And this person only has maybe, he's they got over 3 million followers on Twitter, and they only followed like 72 people or something. So I felt so, so happy and so excited because that person also has, it's very relevant today. He's one of the top stars in the world and he also has his own production company. And I'm, I'm in talks with two other producers. We'll see what happens. I know it's going to happen as far as the movie. I know the series uh, will happen. I don't know which one is going to happen first. It looks like the movie is going to go first. And of course, I, I want to do the documentary. And I was thinking after this book, uh, just, just for my own development, I was going to write a script myself because I have a certain vision on how, how the movie is going to be. So I might take a crack at that, even though I've never written a script in my whole life and the way they, they write scripts. So I might do that uh, and maybe shop it around myself, but uh, we'll see what happens. It's just the COVID-19 thing. And this is not, I don't like excuses. It just makes it a little bit more challenging just because a lot of studios are shut down, but uh, hopefully God willing with the next few months, beginning of the year, they'll, they'll start operating again. So I tried to contact the only one operation, which is the Tyler Perry uh, studios in Atlanta, and I haven't heard back anything yet. Uh, I'm waiting on uh, on certain uh, big interviews with people that have 20, 30 million listeners or followers uh, on air, on TV, on radio. So those those should be up, you know, coming up. So I'm trying my best to uh, to get get the show on the ro road, if you will. So, and this is what I do full time. I do it every day. So we'll see what happens. And with your support, you know, there's nothing that's not possible, right? Uh, I believe in the universe. I believe that we make things happen. Things don't happen to us. So I'll just keep working every day very hard, uh, 15 hours, sometimes more, sometimes less. And I just uh, I just believe that this is this is going to happen. And in my mind's eye, it already happened for sure. So I'm just having real life to catch up with what happened three years from now already in my mind. So that's that's how I usually work. And it works really, really well. So it's just a matter of you projecting and believing in yourself and just doing the work. It, it doesn't just take prayer or reflection. It, it has to come with hard work. Hard work is very, very important. It doesn't just happen by itself. So that's, uh, that's the exciting news. So we'll see what happens. Okay, everybody, if there's no more other questions, uh, we're going on. Thank you, Denver. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Uh, if there's no other questions, we're over an hour already. Uh, I don't want to take up too much of your time. I thank you guys for showing up. I appreciate you. And uh, I, will, I will edit this and post it pretty much within the hour. And if you have any questions, of course, you can always email me at madamsuzanne2020 at gmail.com or leave a comment. And I'll keep you posted. And hopefully I'll have that interview with one of my ex-employees ex-co-workers, if you will. We work together in Orange County, and that should be a really interesting and exciting one. 
Okay, everybody have a good day. I know it's COVID, but just stay happy, stay healthy, stay safe. And if you don't have your health, you don't have anything. And please, if you haven't already, find your own happiness because we all have it within us, okay? And it's your own happiness, nobody else's. So find your own happiness within. Thank you so much. I love you guys and I will see you soon. Bye-bye.